new series, which I'm recording in unprecedented times. In case you hadn't heard, these apparently are unprecedented times. Um, in the space of about six months, I'm recording this in September 2020, by the way. Uh, unprecedented times has become the latest meaningless phrase that we're supposed to say all the time. You see this in all kinds of media, in communications from universities, from workplaces, from government agencies, from you know retail corporations emails of all kinds, uh, it means everything and nothing all at once. It acknowledges that everyone is stressed and confused without saying anything meaningful about that stress or confusion. And it also takes all the politics and the context and, and again, the meaning out of that acknowledgement that everyone's stressed and confused. It's the new small talk. This article from the Chicago Tribune from back in May says that it's the most neutral way of describing the situation we're currently in. And it gives some more examples of some similar vocabulary. For example, if you're feeling, you know, witty, if it's time for some dry humor, maybe you might call these interesting times. Or if you do want to acknowledge that times are hard while also keeping it kind of neutral, you might say something like in these troubling times. I'll add a couple of my own. Um, I often hear people talk about challenging times, and in my opinion, that one's not so bad because it implies there actually is a struggle of some kind. And it also implies some kind of striving, like there's a challenge and we're dealing with it. Um, sometimes people say this to convey a sense of affinity, maybe, or, or solidarity, like we're all in this together. But of course, that's become a cliche of its own. And you see that showing up, for example, um, on the wall of this luxury car dealership. This dealership is located between two neighborhoods in Toronto that used to be low-income housing projects. And uh, it's this kind of joint Bentley, I think Bugatti, Rolls-Royce, uh, I forget what else. Anyway, um, luxury car brands and the dealership on, says on its wall, stronger together. So what are they referring to? Who's stronger together? Is it, you know, wealthy and poor? Is it all of us? Is it just that, you know, the brands of Rolls Royce and Bugatti are stronger when they share retail space? I don't know, but it's a sign of the times, a sign of these unprecedented times. People used to say unpredictable times more than they do now. That's, that's very February or March 2020 um, when things were changing quickly and things did seem pretty unpredictable. I think that started for a lot of people with events being postponed due to coronavirus concerns, which was the most common, you know, sentence in an email uh, in, in those months, I think. Uh, and I think it was often assumed that those postponements would be for, you know, a matter of, of weeks. And then there was that week in March when everything started changing very quickly. For a lot of people, I noticed that it really sunk in when the NBA announced the rest of their season was on hold. I taught my last in-person class on Thursday, March 12th to a group of about... 15 out of 45 enrolled students when normally attendance was more like 40. Um, earlier that day or the next morning, I forget which, it was announced that March break would be extended for the kids by two weeks, and it ended up being a six-month-long March break. Uh, those were unpredictable times, but I think at some point since then, things slid into the so-called new normal. So you also hear the new normal a lot, which might be an even more annoying cliche than unprecedented times. The British linguist Tony Thorne has a glossary of new words and phrases that have come about in 2020 in relation to COVID-19. It's constantly being updated, I think. It's already very long. Um, a list of new adjectives, verbs, slang, hashtags, and more to describe these unprecedented times. Uh, really just charting the evolution of language in real time. Language is, of course, always changing and adapting, but I think it's happening especially quickly in 2020, maybe even with the speed that's unprecedented. All right, I don't mean to be too cynical about this. It's the first episode of the series, so there's lots of time for cynicism uh, as, as we go. Um, obviously, a lot has actually changed, and we don't really know how much or for how long that is, and the changes are almost entirely unpleasant, and it's common for people to use euphemisms to describe hard situations, especially ones they don't fully understand, and especially ones that are still in process, still in flux. My job has changed pretty drastically as a result of all of this, so I, I teach urban studies, uh, anthropology, information studies in a few different university programs. This all started in 2006 when I decided to begin a PhD in anthropology with the goal of becoming a professor of anthropology. And around that time, my favorite way to procrastinate was by watching YouTube, which was new and exciting and unprecedented at the time. I was mostly using it to watch things like music videos from the 80s and the 90s that I was feeling nostalgic for and that it was suddenly possible to watch, you know, at any time 
completely on demand and for free, it was incredible. And it's really hard to compete with my compete with that for my attention. Um, I never expected YouTube, though, to be something I would use for work, uh, for my teaching, which I've been doing over the past few months. Um, what else? I might save some time by not having to commute like I used to, but I spend much more time than I used to spend commuting. I now spend that by editing videos, but part of that is my own fault. That's my own perfectionism. I could just make a simple vocal track and some PowerPoint to go along with it and call that a lecture, but um, I couldn't live with myself if I made things that boring, so I put some extra effort into these videos that I hope are entertaining. I've heard from colleagues and from students that the main change they notice is the loss of informal interaction, which is strange because we've gone from doing this in offices and lecture halls to doing this in our own homes. And when we do that, we tend to dress less formally. I never did dress formally at the best of times, but I've seen other people who used to be very business casual now doing Zoom meetings in, in their painting clothes, basically. Um, we all have complicated lives with multiple overlapping obligations, so it's common for instructors and students alike to have you know background noise like traffic and kids and, and pets as they sit there on Zoom meetings. Um, as for me, I'm making these videos in my, my pandemic recording studio which is my overpriced apartment in the loudest part of Toronto so I don't really have any choice in that so we're gonna have to listen to car horns motorcycles construction uh, people yelling maybe in, in the background of these videos um, it just is what it is to use another popular cliche so I guess things have become paradoxically more formal and also less formal at the same time. Um, what are some other changes well you don't have time to think about things on your commute or have unplanned conversations in the seats of lecture halls or for me I don't run into you know colleagues at the water cooler or students at the coffee shop the kind of conversations we used to have in those situations used to be an important source of tacit knowledge which is the knowledge that emerges from kind of informal unpredictable interactions and you can contrast that with what's called explicit knowledge which is the kind that comes from textbooks and manuals and articles um, tacit knowledge is so valuable that we used to try to make it happen in formal spaces, like in, in seminars or tutorials, as they're called at a lot of universities. Um, for example, there's this old in-class activity that some people used in seminars called bus stop. And uh, I always hated this, so I'm not saying we should go back to it. I'm just using this as an example of how tacit knowledge is so important. We used to try to replicate it in explicit knowledge situations. Anyway. Bus stop, as it's called, uh, and as I dislike very much, is where you get two people to go in front of the class and they act out a little skit as if they just ran into each other while waiting for a bus at a bus stop. And they're supposed to engage in some light, unpredictable, informal banter about the readings of the day. So it might look something like this. Oh, hey, how's it going? That's uh, a big coincidence that we ran into each other at a bus stop. I know, it's amazing, right? We go to the same university. And uh, I guess we also take the same bus because here we are running into each other at the bus stop. Sure is a small world. So, tell me about the reading of the class that you just came from. Well, I was hoping you would ask. It was a chapter of a textbook about this idea, structural functionalism, which was a pretty important part in the development of anthropological theory. Oh, that's perfect because I, actually structural functionalism has always been one of my favorite things to talk about when I'm um, just passing time waiting for the bus, so please tell me more. Worst seminar activity ever. It was painful for almost everybody. I mean, some people who happen to enjoy drama would get creative with it and make it funny, but for the most part, it was just painful. Um, I'm just mentioning it because it's an example, I think, of how important tacit knowledge is. So important that we used to try to make tacit knowledge happen in spaces that were set up for sharing explicit knowledge. And now in these unprecedented times, it's even harder to make that happen when we don't have the informal spaces that we used to have, that we used to move through on the way to the formal spaces in which to share that tacit knowledge. Not just in teaching, but also in anthropology itself, especially in sociocultural anthropology, because our main research method is just hanging out informally in communities. And I don't have the solution for this. I have some ideas that I'll share as the series goes on. But for now, I guess like academics always do, I'll just point out the problems and then try to get to some solutions a bit later. It's also a problem for anthropology itself, uh, not just anthropology classrooms, but the entire discipline as a whole. Um, many anthropologists, myself included, will tell you that you often get the best data from the moments when 
you kind of feel like you're doing nothing. You're just informally hanging out in the community and going with the flow and then thinking about those experiences later. Uh, the anthropologist Clifford Geertz calls those moments deep hanging out. Um, what does it mean for that when nobody is supposed to be hanging out in communities in the way they used to, when you know most parts of the planet are under some degree of slow down or shut down or lockdown, and if they're not right now, they probably will be again soon to at least some extent. Um, anthropologists were starting to think about the implications of you know some of these questions since at least the 1990s when the possibility of doing online field work first started to emerge with the widespread adoption of, of the internet uh, beginning. Um, but there was still then and now this enduring sense that field work is really about being, you know, on the ground in physical spaces, doing real research in real places, as, as the, the phrasing goes, to get an insider view of the culture. And also traveling to that place in which the anthropologist does research. There's this old assumption that also still endures to at least some extent that anthropologists do research in faraway places, or as they used to be called, exotic places, though no self-respecting anthropologist will ever use that word anymore, the, the E word exotic, without you know putting up the scare quotes first. Um, and that, to me, is a good example of how the theory and the methods of anthropology have been forced to change by massive geopolitical shifts many times in the past in that example in a way that I feel is obviously a good way. It was decolonization that brought that one on. The colonial baggage is still there in the discipline and all around us, but not many anthropologists still see themselves as, you know, detached experts whose job it is to go crack the code of these so-called other so-called exotic cultures. The point I'm trying to make is that, yeah, these times are unprecedented, but they're also in other ways precedented. We, we can look at everything happening right now and recognize how new it is, but also see historical and cultural roots in all of those things. Um, campuses being shut down due to a pandemic is a new thing. But, for example, there was a push towards online learning at all levels of study happening well before March 2020. Um, the feeling of alienation that can result from working and studying exclusively on Zoom is also something many of us are experiencing to a new extent. It, it definitely feels new and is new in many ways. But maybe it's also just the latest, you know, iteration of the kind of alienation that we started to feel that started to set in about, what, 10, 12 years ago when it became the new normal to be constantly connected to the Internet through your smartphone that was with you all the time. Um, or if you believe most Marxists, maybe the, both of those things are also just relatively new iterations of the kind of alienation that started to set in with the beginnings of capitalism a lot longer ago. All that is leading up to my intro to this new brief video series called Ethnography and Culture, in which I talk about some other pieces of anthropology from other unprecedented times. I'll be focusing on a selection of studies that bring to life the cultural changes, the conflicts, the politics, the struggles, but also the fun and the creativity that ordinary people experience and, and enact in their daily lives at times when their worlds were changing completely. Uh, that also includes moments when anthropology was changing completely. Some of the work I'll talk about is really well known. It's it's part of the canon that, you know, everyone studying anthropology will probably read or at least read about at some point. And uh, other parts of the material are lesser known. Some of it was forgotten for years and then kind of came back on the radar to at least some extent. And others are still pretty much completely unknown, including my own work. Uh, this series won't be anything too dense, or you know, at least I hope not. I guess it's not for me to say. Uh, but it is made for an audience who knows something about cultural anthropology. But for those who have never, never studied this field before, um, this video and the next video will include some basics of what this kind of anthropology is all about. And if you're watching this because you're taking my second year university course and you've never studied anthropology before, then I recommend you watch episodes three and four of my last series called Making Sense of a Changing World. There's links in the description. Um, that's a series that I made for a first year intro to anthro course, and those two episodes in particular are kind of a crash course in cultural anthropology, what anthropologists do, uh, why we do it, and the history of the discipline in a kind of 101 uh, framing. If you've studied anthropology in the past, there probably won't be much in those two videos that is news to you, but again, if you're new to this, they might help you get, get caught up to, in order to watch the series.
But let's do some 101 right now. Why not? Uh, the series is called Ethnography and Culture, so I think I'll take a moment to define those two terms. We'll start with culture. What is culture to an anthropologist? Well, it's, it's a system of meaning. It's shared by a group of people. It's not something an individual can just make up. It's not random. It's a system. People use that system to understand what's happening around them and how they fit into it. It's, it's usually unconscious. It's usually taken for granted. Obviously, there is a lot more to it than just this. Culture is a meaningful concept, but it's also a complex and at times a self-contradictory concept. And in the rest of this series, we'll look at what some ethnographers have done with those contradictions and that complexity. As for ethnography, that's what anthropologists do, uh, ethnographic research. The most common components of ethnographic research are participant observation, uh, interviews, focus groups. We do some other stuff as well. Uh, field work means using those methods for an extended period of time, usually for a year or two, in the community you're studying. And that's really what makes anthropology what it is. And like I said before, the most meaningful parts of field work, I think, are the ones in which you feel like nothing's happening, when you just kind of fade into the background, taking in the flow of everyday life around you, and then later documenting that in the form of an ethnography. So ethnography is the method, and an ethnography is, is the physical, the, the final product, right? The book you can hold in your hand, like this one, Renegade Dreams by Lawrence Ralph. Um, that one is, is Lawrence Ralph's study of, of gangs and community organization in a low-income neighborhood in Chicago, and we'll look at that in some detail a bit later on in the series. So last thing for this brief video is I'll preview some of the other works that I'll talk about later on in the series, other works that were written during other unprecedented times. For example, the next episode, Off the Veranda, I'll talk about the work of Branislaw Malinowski, who was not the first anthropologist and not the first to do field work either, but he's often credited as being the anthropologist who made fieldwork the, the new normal in anthropology. So we'll look at some examples from his research on the Trobrian Islands in the South Pacific uh, around the time of, of World War I. We'll also look at the work of Zora Neale Hurston, a much lesser recognized anthropologist who studied cultural change in the Caribbean and in African-American communities in the 1920s and 30s. Those were other examples from the past of, you know, anthropologists doing research during unprecedented times and using unprecedented methodologies. But of course, there was roots to all of this. My own specialty is urban anthropology, so we'll look at some examples of what, how urbanization played out worldwide and what anthropologists have said about that. For example, in Southern Africa, where anthropologists studied how local culture was transformed as people moved into newly established mining towns and how the culture that emerged in those towns was fluid and dynamic, how people held on to their pre-colonial identities and affiliations while also developing new ones at the same time as they became industrial workers. But it was also a very unequal society, of course, and those anthropologists certainly documented that aspect of the experience as well. A couple of other highlights. Later on, we get into studying up, which Laura Nader put on the map of anthropology in the early 70s. Um, most, well, I think everything I've said so far has reflected this assumption that anthropologists study the culture and the experiences of ordinary people, so usually non-powerful people. But as Laura Nader put it uh, near the beginning of that piece on studying up, uh, I'll just quote from that, that article from 1972, I think it was, uh, she wrote, never before have so few by their actions and inactions had the power of life and death over so many members of the species. Um, kind of an interesting thought, and that was almost 50 years ago. Um, she felt that anthropologists might have something useful, important to say about those who held that power in that unprecedented situation. And as one example of some more recent work in that vein, we'll look at Karen Ho's study of the culture of Wall Street investment bankers. Uh, and she did that research around the time of the 2008 financial crisis, no less, which was also kind of an unprecedented time, but also precedented in some ways. A bit later on, I'll share some of my own research. And let me be completely clear, that's not because my own research is a highlight of anthropology or influential at all. It is neither of these things 
for certain. Um, you know, no, nobody knows who I am. Uh, but part of the series is about the, the craft of ethnography. So I thought it would be useful for me to share some of my own findings and my own experiences with doing research on low-income urban communities in, in, in Canada, especially the Regent Park community located in downtown Toronto. And that part will also get into the overlap between anthropology and history because a lot of my research was about how people make sense of their own history and their own lived experience. So a, a little bit of kind of using the theory and some of the methods of anthropology to try to reconstruct the past, which is normally seen as what historians do. And towards the end of the series, we'll look at some research on the SARS epidemic as it played out in Toronto in 2003, which is kind of a precedent to these current unprecedented times. All right, those were just some examples of what this series is all about. There's lots more as well. I hope you'll join me for it. And I'll be back in about a week with episode two, Off the Veranda. Until then, thank you for watching.